uh, to the book of Micah. The book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. from the subject, God fixed my country. God fixed my country. Well, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, there are a few things that I believe that preaching should be. And there are a few things that I believe that preaching should do. Preaching, number one, is to convey the word of God to the people of God. But then second thing is that the, the preaching moment should be relevant. It should be what they call an on-time word from an on-time God. It is said to us in homiletics class that in order to be an effective preacher, you must have two things at your disposal. Number one, you must have the Bible. Because it is the word of God. And then the second thing that you must have is a newspaper. That you are aware of what is going on in the land that we live. Well, I said all of that to say this. Is that when we looked in our news media for the past week or four days, you have to be almost tuned out to the world if you did not hear about the things that happened in the next county over in the great city of Greenville, North Carolina. You would have to be almost tuned out from society if you did not hear on the national news media MSNBC and CNN and, and in all different types of channels about the goings on that happened just a few days ago. Not in the next day. Not in, not in California. Not in Alabama. Not in New York City. But right here. Where chants were being echoed, send her back. Yeah. I understand today. Some people will say that we are not to be political behind the pulpit. I'm not being political. But I am trying to inject the prophetic voice of God into the condition of our society. All right. All right. What do we do? Right. What do we say? Uh, How do we respond when things are said and done that disrupts our national temperature? Uh, 
not anchor in Jesus, you'll truly and surely drift away. Today, I want to talk to you about a nation. And, 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 and I'm going to talk to you really about two nations. But the first nation that I want to talk about is the nation of Israel. And so when we look at the book of Micah, the book Micah was one of the writing prophets. And so whenever we say prophets, there were many prophets throughout the Old Testament, many prophets throughout the New Testament, but not all of them wrote. And so then, when we look at the book of Micah, Micah was one of the minor prophets. Uh, and Micah was one of the earlier prophets that prophesied over Israel and Judah. Okay. Somebody says, well, what is the role of a prophet? The role of a prophet is to speak truth to power. All right. All right. The role of a prophet is to say what God says right. without fear of what may happen to you. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. And what do you say uh -huh. when it seems as though the nation may be going in a direction that is not of God? Right. I'm not here today to talk about Trump. Uh -huh. I'm not here to talk about the Republican Party uh -huh. or the Democratic Party. I'm not here to talk about President Obama, but I'm here to talk about God. Because in times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. In times like these, we need a word from the Lord. And the only thing that I'm crying out is, Lord, fix our country. Israel, when we look, number one, at Micah. Micah was one who understood the sensitivity for the sufferings of the poor and the powerless. You see, that was an important thing for us to understand because as we continue to study the book of Micah, we see that Micah paid special attention to the same people that Jesus paid attention to. And those were the least, the lost, and the last. Amen. And church, I'm glad today. Amen. Because I wasn't born with a silver spoon. Right. I, I, I'm glad today. Because my parents had to work. And they had to work hard to get what they had. I, I, I'm glad today. Because Jesus, when he looks down upon the people, he pays attention to everybody. Yeah. But he is especially interested in those who cannot help themselves. He is concerned about the widow and the orphan. And Micah was one that came from, amen, a group, amen, of poor people. He was one who came from a village, amen, of those who were poor and powerless. The church, I'm so glad today that, as it is said, it does not matter where you come from, Amen. but it only matters where you're going to. Amen. But you see, if we're going to go somewhere as a people of God, if we're going to go somewhere as a community of believers, we've got to have the right one on our side. Because right. right. one thing that I found out is that some people will say one thing to your face, but then you turn around and they'll say something else. But we need somebody who will fight our battles. We need somebody who will plead our case. And so when we look at Micah chapter number six, God says to his people, I'm gonna take my people to court. You see, we got to be careful because God had a charge against Israel. All right. and, and, and long story short, the charge was that they missed, uh, they abused the favor of God. All right, all right. Help us, Lord. Help us. We must be careful how we treat the favor of God that is on our lives. 
We must be careful how we boast about what we have. We must be careful in our treatment of other folks. We must be careful in the way that we treat those that don't look like us, that don't behave like us, that don't act like us. We've got to be careful how we treat the favor of God. God does not bless us for us to sit in the four walls of the church and shout about how blessed we are. All right. When the Bible speaks of overflow blessings, when it speaks of cups running over, when it speaks of not having room enough to receive, what God says is that I will bless my people so much that they will have what they need, but not have enough to share with somebody else. about money because we all know there's a lot of stuff that money cannot buy. You can have a million dollars in the bank and not have peace of mind. You can have good credit but not have joy in your heart. You can live in the finest house on top of a hill but you're still worried and confused about every little thing that goes on. We are not blessed just to keep it in, but we are blessed to share it with somebody else. And not just our monetary blessings, but when God releases favor on our lives, then God says, this is what I want you to do. God says, I don't want you to be a sponge. But he says, I really want you to be like a mirror. And I want you to reflect my goodness back on me and back on the world. The same way that I had mercy on you, you go and have mercy on somebody else. And God says that Israel misabused their power. They misabused the favor of God that was on their lives. So God says, I'm getting ready to take my people to court. And no, he's not taking them to Judge Judy. No, he's not taking them to Judge Mathis. But he says, I got a complaint against my people. And so he says, come on and let's go to the heavenly courtroom. And I'm going to plead my case. But let me call in the jury. Somebody says, well, who is the jury going to be? God says, I'm going to call forth the mountains to be the jury to hear the case that I have against my people. So God begins to outline his charges that he has against Israel. But you see, we must look at that and apply that to our lives. Remember, I'm not here to talk about anybody else. I'm here to talk about us. We have to look at our own lives and say, God, is there any charge that you have against me? But you see, in this text, remember that the, that the charge was not, you know, where, where they were last night. You know, sometimes in the church, we get focused on the wrong stuff. What we were doing last night. I don't care what you were doing last night. I'm on there. My, my own business. I don't care where you were. But what God says is, that what have you done with the favor that I have put on your life? He says, oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? God says, let me plead my case. Because wasn't I the one that brought you out? When you were bound up in slavery, wasn't I the one that carried you from out of the land of Pharaoh? Wasn't I the one that brought you 
country and in the land where you are right now. All right. All right. That's true. All right. <laughs> so, God says, let me remind you about what my requirements are because Israel was falling into a circle similar to the same thing that Saul did. Uh -huh. Is that Saul, remember King Saul, his problem was that he would rather sacrifice than obey. He would rather sacrifice than obey. What are you trying to say, Pastor Messick? Sacrifice was an atonement for sin. And so what, what Saul said was, I'd rather do, I'm going to do what I want to do because I know that God's going to forgive me. Uh, Y'all know how it is when folks do what's wrong? No, you do it wrong once. Shame, shame on you. Boom me twice. Shame on me. But what God is saying is that it is not in the sacrifice, but it is in the obedience. And so this is what God said. I have requirements of my people. And, and he says, I got three main things. And I'm going to lift up these three things and we're going to be on about the Lord's business. Because God says, oh mortal, what is it that is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But he says, the first thing that I require of my people is to do justice. Yeah. And so God is a just God. And God is one that will plead the cause for those who have been hurt, to those who have been injured, to those who have been disenfranchised. Well, you know what? We can look back over our lives and, and we can look back and we can see what things have happened to us and things that people have done to us and things that people have said about us. But guess what? God says, don't worry about it. Because God says, I will take care of those who are trying to mess with you. That's shouting for somebody. But guess what? The same way that God fights for us, God says, I need for you to go fight for somebody. One of the things that irks me to no end is when we get in church and we ask God to do everything. We ask God to go everywhere. God do this. God do that. God go over here. God go over there. Flip back around. Make a U-turn. Go up. Go down. Left, right, side to side. Up, down, all around. What are we doing? the same way God fought our battles. We got to stand in the gap for somebody else. Because when we look back over our lives, it doesn't matter how bad we think that we have it, there's always somebody else that is in a worse condition than we are. What are we doing to reach the least, the lost, and the last? Or do we just celebrate about how good we have it? Or are we reaching back and helping somebody else? Are we standing up for those things that are right? Are we speaking out against the injustices of the world? Or do we just pray about it? Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with prayer. I love prayer. But after you get through praying, you ought to do something else. Because prayer is not the end. Prayer is just going to the gas station. And whenever I go to the gas station, I just don't sit there at the pump, fill up my tank, get back in my car. Oh, I got a full tank now. No, in order for the gas that you put in your vehicle to be effective, you got to start the car back up again and keep on going. God 
says that number one, I require my people to be or to do justice. Next thing that I want to point out about this passage is that he says he wants us to do. That means that when it comes to the ministry of justice, it must be active. All right. You do justice. You show forth justice. But then the next point that I want to make is that he says we are to love kindness. Or some versions of the Bible says to love mercy. And whenever we look at that word mercy, that word, the way I like to look at that word mercy is to do unto others as we would have them to do unto us. When I look at that word mercy in this context, we all know and we call on the Lord and many times when we don't know what to say, we say, Lord, have mercy. And church, we are all recipients of the mercy of God. Because mercy is just like this. If you are to ever get pulled over for speeding, you deserve a ticket. But the police officer says, I'm going to give you a warning. That was mercy. You deserve to get the ticket. But, but the police officer said, I'm just going to give you a warning. Well, that's how God is towards us. The things that we deserve, God, mercy says no. When justice demanded death for our soul, mercy stepped in and said no. And because we are recipients of God's mercy, then we got to show mercy towards somebody else. When in our lives do we see people that need somebody just to, as they used to say, pity them or to look down upon them and not just look down upon them, but do what is necessary to lift them up from the situation that they are in. God fix my country. But God says, if we want God to fix our country, we got to do what the Lord requires of us. And so number one, God says that we are to be in the ministry of justice. Number two, God says that we are to love and to show mercy. But then the last thing, and I'm getting ready to go to my seat. God says, I want you to walk humbly before God. And so there is a distinct difference here between pride and humility. And so, they, and so we must be careful when it comes to our relationship with God, that we don't stick our chest out, and that we act as though we are better than somebody else, only because of who we are. The problem that Israel had was that Israel operated in the spirit of pride, because they said that because we are the descendants of Abraham, because we are the inheritance of this land, that we can do what we want to do and say what we want to say, and God's going to have our back. But lean over to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, if you want God to do right by you, you got to do right by God. Can I get a witness somebody? I'm so glad today that if we do right by God, if we walk only before God, then God says, I will rise up and I will fight your battles. If we do right by God, God says, I'll rise up. I'll be a doctor in the sick room. God says, if we do right, he will fix our land. God says, if we do right, we can get in trouble. If the U.S. Army can't help you, if the Marine Corps can't God says, I'm a battle axe in a time of trouble. Can I get a witness? Just a one man witness. Is there anybody here? Have you ever been in trouble? Did the Lord show up? Is there anybody?